The Victorians were just masters of illusion, so masterful in fact that they continue to deceive us into the 21st century and we continue to buy it. So this is going to be a slightly off-the-cuff video because I read yet another one of those oh-so-profuse comments about how impossibly tiny the Victorian waste must have been and how suffering they must have been. And I know I've touched on this topic in various places throughout my videos, but I wanted one specific central place on this channel where you can go to debunk the myth of the impossibly tiny Victorian waste because to the modern educated mind what we see when we see a tiny waste is someone who has pulled a corset so impossibly tightly that they must not be able to breathe, they must not be able to eat, they must be on the verge of fainting just because that is what we tend to have been taught about this period. I would argue for the most part what you're seeing is largely an illusion. So we have a couple of options that we can employ in order to sort of give the illusion that we have this very tiny waste. And these are all practices that were used and employed with profuse regularity throughout history. Each person based on their comfort levels and their desired outcome will choose a different selection of these methods. And this is what I want to sort of go over today so that when you see photos or paintings of Victorians or even earlier in the periods, you know what you're looking at and you're not in this mindset of, oh my god, they all must have been size 0000, 0, 0, 0 humans because that was not the fashionable body type in the 19th century. That is not what the Victorian is going for and we're gonna, we're gonna go over this. So the first, of course, is reduction. You can put on a corset and tight lace it down or just lace it down and reduce the width of your waist measurement. Different body types tend to have different ease and ability to do this than others. So arguably the people who tend to the most suited towards dramatic waist reduction are people of larger body sizes and people with softer cores. People with very athletic body types who are very solid and muscular or bony don't tend to be able to get much reduction or if you do reduce it takes a lot of effort and it can be quite uncomfortable, even painful. So I have a, a number of things going on. Not only do I not have a fleshy middle but I also have some musculoskeletal deformities going on which makes reduction for me difficult if not completely impossible. So the wearing of a corset, and I cannot stress this enough, and this has been stressed profusely all over the costuming corners of the internet, should be worn to your comfort. It was worn to the wearer's comfort all throughout history, for the most part, unless you're going for an extremely fashionable, extremely idealized figure and you're willing to endure some level of discomfort for the sake of fashion. The ideal Victorian proportions or Edwardian proportions are the bust to be 10 inches larger than the waist and 15 inches smaller than the hips. So if you are able to achieve that solely through reduction and be completely comfortable doing so, that's great. You're good, you're golden, you've done it, problem solved. A lot of people cannot do it through reduction alone comfortably. And this is something that Hollywood very often misinterprets when representing historical periods is that they tend to cast very slim actresses to play these roles, which is not a problem. I mean, every one of every body type existed all throughout history, but instead of augmenting the hips and the bust, Hollywood just has it in their head that everything must be reduced. Everything has to be as tiny as you can possibly make it. So you end up with these very thin actresses who don't lace down, who don't have natural reduction naturally, because that's not how their bodies work. You put them into these corsets and you try and reduce them. You try and get the inches down two, three, four inches. That's not how they work. That will not be comfortable for them. And hence, we get all of the complaints. <laughs> Wearing a corset does, you know, you feel like you can't breathe sometimes. It's pinching me everywhere, restricting my rib cage. And I put this corset on and then I was like, oh. What we should be doing instead is augmenting the bust and hips so that their waists already naturally look very tiny. And that is where the other options come in. The option that personally I prefer is augmentation. It is the padding of the bust and the hips to pad out those proportional measurements. The reason that this Edwardian ideal, this Victorian ideal is this way is because those proportions make that waist look very small to the eye. I will use what I'm doing as an example, but maybe don't take this as the one true method because my situation is particularly unusual. Just to take a base waist measurement. The waist, by the way, on some people it's the slimmest portion of the torso, on most people it is the point at which you crease. 
So you don't want to measure here, which is your high hip, which a lot of people think is the waist, and you don't want to measure down here, that's the hip. So we are looking at around 25 and a half inches. We're gonna give this a go. Okay, so as an absolute base layer, I've got a pair of combinations on. This could equally be a chemise. This is purely just keeping my skin safe from the corset to prevent rubbing, chafing, discomfort, as well as protecting the corset from having to come into contact with my skin and thus needing to be washed every day. Sometimes it can be built with these little illusion techniques already happening. As you can see, we've got a fitted waistband with a deliberately very fluffy front here and a bit of gathering at the waist so that, you know, when you're just walking around in your combinations, apparently, you're already giving a little bit of that hourglass vibe. So this is a bit of a um, debated topic as to whether the corset is padded or whether the padding is added on top of the clothing. The general consensus is that anything goes. It depends on what you're comfortable with. Personally, I've added the padding into my corset. So as you can see, I mean, you know this if you watched the making portion of this corset. I've got a bit of bust padding, a bit of hip padding already built into the inside of this corset. So when I put it on, it is already good to go, already starting to do some of the work for me. Some pairs of combinations and some chemises can be built with a little bit of ruffling at the top, some bows, some extra fluff that is slightly deliberate so that when something goes over top of that, this is held out by the front and that adds a little bit of volume just up here, which can help with the whole illusion situation. This is stiffened with synthetic baleen, which is a synthetic fake whalebone, it's not real whalebone, but it behaves like real whalebone. So meaning that it is very flexible. Real whalebone was very flexible and you can bend, you can move. I've still got plenty of room down here. I can fit my whole hand down here and it's just, it's just delightful. I can move, I can bend, I can breathe. This is all just fine and dandy. So theoretically over top of this layer goes what would be called a corset cover, which is just a bodice layer of something roughly. Mostly the point of it is just to hide the ridge of the corset here. I'm actually using a chemise, which is going to have a similar effect up top and it won't be seen on the bottom because it will just be covered with a petticoat anyway, but just so that you know. One of the additional benefits of the corset cover beyond just smoothing everything out up here is that it it could very often be built with lots of ruffles and lots of frills at the top so if you are nearing the ideal proportions up top then you could just add a little bit of ruffleage at the top and be fine and not have to do any padding personally i need as much help as i can get so i've got my padding in the corset and then i've got my well i've got some roughly bow layers with my under layer and i've also got the gathering up here and the frill up here which will help to once again just give me a little bit of fluff up here the next layer is the bustle pad once again this can be as large or as small as you need it to be i've got just relatively slim little pad here that will just come across not so much across the hips because i already am wide enough at the bottom but then across the back as well and this gets tied at the waist kind of, but slightly below because you don't want any of this bulk interfering with the actual waistline because then that just adds bulk, which is what we're trying to avoid. And over top of this goes the petticoat. Once again, this petticoat is built primarily to just smooth out all of these layers. As you can see, this petticoat is uh, built off of a Victorian pattern. So it's got this yoke across the top, which will keep everything nice and smooth just around the high hip area. And then we've got a little bit of gathering at the back, which will help to give us some fluff right where we want the fluff. So as you can see, we are beginning to look a bit like our friend back here, although our waist measurement is quite a bit larger than hers. So the next tactic of illusion is quite literally illusion, the illusion of the outer garments that you're wearing over top of your corset. The dresses, the jackets, the coats, the whatever, are all built to sort of trick the eye into seeing a very specific shape. So for example, in the middle of the 19th century, when the fashion was for the waist to be very, very small, it is arguably the period of the smallest waist in fashion. This is also why, coincidentally in this period, we tend to have arguably some of the largest skirts in history. We have those very big, large, round crinoline skirts, which make the base of the dress look very large and it widens the hips, of course, 
therefore, by comparison, making the waist look very tiny. Augmenting the shoulders with sleeve puffs or shoulder padding, or sort of elongating the shoulder line, as was done in the middle of the 19th century by dropping that shoulder seam and making the shoulders look very low and sloped. Incidentally, in the Regency period, where the waist is not really a feature of the silhouette, we have very small sleeves. And this is, I think, why we tend to think that so many of these garments are made for very, very tiny people, because when we look at them, we, all we see is the proportions. All we see is the sloped shoulders. All we see is the big skirts, the, the densely pleated waist seam, and therefore the tiny waist and we just assume it must have been made for a very tiny person. Kenna Liebes, who's a dress historian, has put together a really interesting database of extant garments with their waist measurements. And you can see how many of these garments don't have teen or low twenties waists. This dress, for example, you would look at this and you would think, oh, you know, she's pretty tiny, right? This dress, the waist measurement on this dress measures 37 and a half inches. The key is to make your shirt waist a little bit fluffy around the waist so that when it gets cinched in with the waistband of the skirt, then it looks like you've got a very tight, very small waist because look how far in it's going compared to all the fluff going on over top. So finally, we are adding the skirt. This once again has a very tight waistband here, which will sit nice and flat against the waistband. I'm going to fluff out this front a little bit because that will once again help just to make things look a little bit smaller than they actually are. And here's a neat little trick is these waistbands can be as tight as you want them to be and you will not feel it because you already have this corset. You can already move and breathe, but the waistband's just going to sit flat against the corset and you're not going to feel a thing. So equally, an equal bit of magic that was often employed is these very large sashes. And this is something that I noticed when I did my Mary Poppins project is that you can put on one of these very wide very tight sashes and pull it very tight. And it looks like because it is sitting so tight and so flat against your waist, that it's really cinching you in. Even though really, you know, it's sitting flat against the corset, I can't feel a thing. So here is our final result. I don't know, this is like the worst possible background you could film this in front of. So here is the final result. Here's what we have. I can move, I can breathe, I can bend, I can still fit an entire hand down in my corset if I wanted to. We are clocking in at a roomy 26, so we've added a half an inch, even though by illusion we look a little bit smaller. By contrast, here is where we are in the same outfit minus all of the sculptural understructures. So as you can see, we are much more just sort of standard human shape, so we are not quite as dramatic as the Victorians. So we do end up with a slightly different shape here and not a, you know, quite quintessentially Victorian shape. So last but most definitely not least, the final measure that you can take to ensure that your waist appears the absolute most snatched it can possibly be is image manipulation. This was profuse in the late 19th century all throughout the 19th century, really. But the ability to manipulate an image has been in existence almost as long as photography has existed. Essentially, never trust a picture of a Victorian, especially where the waist looks absolutely impossibly tiny. And especially when that waist is next to a backdrop that is not terribly busy and can very easily just be scraped down ever so slightly because that is very much what they were doing. Everything from waist measurements to body shape to facial features and skin texture, anything could be realistically just altered a slight, slight amount. So as is generally good practice today, don't believe the photos that you see on social media because most of them have probably been facetuned or otherwise edited to some capacity. So too have photographs all throughout history. So why do we have this idea that all of the Victorians were just very, very tiny? One reason, of course, is the amount of very, very tiny garments that do genuinely survive to us today. So how do we explain that? Who are these people? Where are they coming from? And to this, I say to you, survivorship bias. These dresses still exist in their almost pristine museum quality display worthy condition precisely because not a lot of people could fit into them. They couldn't receive as much wear. They didn't have the opportunity to completely degrade. A lot of these garments that are very small are worn by very young women before they have finished growing, before they've grown out of these garments. And so they don't have the 
most amount of time to be worn and therefore are often in the best condition, if not surviving completely. The Victorians were just masters of illusion, so masterful in fact that they continue to deceive us into the 21st century and we continue to buy it. But it's really interesting to study because a lot of these techniques and practices can be employed still today to achieve aesthetic ideals that are seemingly impossible to achieve without necessarily causing yourself harm. And this is one of the things that I think the Victorians actually might have been onto historically in that one of the things that I think we are really misunderstanding about today is that there is one specific way that you have to do things in order to achieve one specific ideal. History teaches us that there are other options. History teaches us that there are a vast number of body types when you look at tailoring books of this period, it's not just here's how to draft for this one body type. There are entirely different sets of instructions, drafting instructions for all different sorts of body types and not just body size, but different skeletal configurations. So basically, no, the Victorians were not ubiquitously impossibly small. They were in fact employing a wide range of different methods to trick the eye into perceiving a very specific body ideal and that these methods were employed across a range of various body types and in accordance to the wearer's not only physical composition but personal comfort. I think that is just so magical and I think it's even more incredible that this practice has literally just been so well implemented that it has been completely forgotten and has managed to continue to trick us into the 21st century. I think that is magical and there's something in there that we can learn. Speaking of expert illusions, this video is brought to you by NordVPN, the fastest virtual private network service working to help keep your online presence safe. But NordVPN is not only a VPN service protecting your devices from being spied upon by tracking sites and online malware. NordVPN also offers a whole host of other privacy-oriented services, like password management, ensuring that your passwords are unique and hard to hack across all of your logins, and dark web monitoring, so you can be kept aware of any of your personal information being leaked to malicious establishments. Plus, you get to ensure that your IP address, and thus your location, remain nicely hidden. Where in the world is Bernadette Banner? Wouldn't HBO like to know? Too bad they won't see through the careful guise of NordVPN, and I can carry on tricking them into thinking I'm in the United States whilst I consume all of their content. Get the exclusive NordVPN deal at nordvpn.com slash Bernadette. It is risk-free with Nord's 30-day money-back guarantee. <gasps> I'm literally never getting out of here. <laughs> Absolutely nothing amiss has happened here.